Hopefully this talk will be about what machine learning can and can't do for security. So my name is my name is Wendy Edwards. Let me start by introducing myself. I'm from Urbana, Illinois, which is about 200 kilometers south of Chicago. It is probably most famous as the birthplace of HAL 9000 in 2001. So I work in my day job as a software developer. I am part of the NASA Data Knots, which is what gave me an interest in uh, data science and machine learning. And I also got to participate in the 2017 um, SANS Women's Academy. And on Twitter, I am wayward710, and my pronouns are uh, she and her. So what are we going to talk about? Let's start with terminology and concepts, and we'll have some examples, and we'll also talk about the limitations of machine learning. So first, probably a lot of you have heard of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. And they kind of, and they're essentially kind of nested within each other. Um, AI is the broadest category, and then machine learning, and then deep learning. So basically, artificial intelligence, um, if you recall, since I'm from Urbana, which is the birthplace of um, HAL 9000, this here is a picture of HAL 9000. Um, and artificial intelligence, which would include HAL, would be the branch of computer science uh, that basically attempts to emulate human intelligence. And slightly more narrowly defined, we get machine learning. So machine, lear machine learning is really actually a lot of math. Uh, so you, and you can have, um, and it looks for patterns and inferences, and, you, and um, you can have something called super. You got things called supervised and unsupervised learning. Those are the uh, main categories. And so, supervised learning. Um, probably anybody in stats may have heard about uh, prior probability called uh, Bayesian Bayesian modeling, and that is heavily used by um, su by uh, supervised learning. And with with unsupervised learning, you're basically drawing abstractions from unlabeled data sets. So, for example, with uh, supervised learning, you tend to have labeled data sets, which means you have the answers. Um, unsupervised learning, you don't have the data sets. You don't have the answers. The data sets are not necessarily labeled. And uh, you could draw, so they could draw abstractions from these uh, unlabeled data sets. Uh, so, of course, uh, one challenge with, with unsupervised learning could be uh, making sure that you have it right. And then we'll talk about um, so uh, we'll talk about deep learning, which also use uh, the concept of uh, neural networking. So neural networks are actually not a new thing; they were invented in 1942. And so they're they're basically uh, modeled on the whole idea of, of uh, layers of neurons. So they're modeled after the human brain. So the layers are made out of nodes, and so the nodes is basically just where computation happens, which is kind of how a neuron works. And essentially, it fires when it can uh, encounter sufficient stimuli. Um, so the node combines um, input from data with a set of coefficients or weights that either amplify or dampen that input. So it's like, um, do you want more of this input or less of that input? In the so the algorithm by going through this process is trying to learn uh, what will get the uh, kind of how what will bring you the closest to the right answer. And here we have a picture of a neural network. So we've got, in this case, we have it's it is it's what's called a feed-forward neural network. Um, so you have an in, you have um, a input layer. Then you have, in this case you have one hidden layer with four neurons, but you could have more or less neurons or uh, more or less hidden um, hidden layers, and you have an output layer. So that is essentially just what they're talking about. And now we're going to look at some um, videos of some videos uh, showing neural networks. So you can kind of see, I don't hope the animation works, you can kind of see it's gradually getting, it's actually, it's gradually getting better and better. Because so you want, because you're talking about the test loss and training loss, and you want those losses to be as small as possible, but you kind of see, it's, it's actually just trying to add, a, um, accurately categorize the dots in the picture. And you can see it's getting closer and closer. This is basically the TensorFlow program, which like, anybody can use. It, it's just a very interesting way to see neural networks in, in action.
So, uh, so um, when you talk about neural networks, you often talk about uh, tweaking parameters, and that means you might adjust your you might adjust your inputs, you might adjust your layers to have more or less. And so here, let's see what happens if we tweak it by just adjusting the input a little bit. So by doing that, we actually added, we uh, we, we st stayed with only one hidden layer of full neural networks. We added more, we added more um, features, which is which are more inputs. And if you watched it really closely, you could see it was very accurate, but it uh, worked a lot more quickly than the previous one. And that could be that could be actually very significant, like when you have big data. And then this, and here we're, we're actually going to look um, at. This is a slightly different kind of pattern. And then actually that, if I recall correctly, moves works a lot more quickly if you have fewer input layers. But that is just a neural network um, in action. And you can kind of see from the weights of the line which, in, which inputs are weighted higher or which inputs are weighted lower. So essentially deep learning, when we talk about it's the it could also be called stacked neural networks. So we got uh, a network composed of several layers. Um, big data is a very big challenge. Uh, one thing that's helped with uh, with neural networks is um, advancements in GPU processing. Um, and GPU processing is a graphical processing unit, and that's that's often used in um, basically big computing. So it's not a silver bullet because. So it needs an extensively labeled data set, and, and that is a lot easier to say than do. And the, um, but if but if you can get that, if you can get such a thing, it, there are a whole lot of things you can do with it. You can use computer vision, speech recognition, natural language processing, uh, machine translation. I don't know if you've ever used like uh, Google Translate or DeepL.com, but those are machine learning. Uh, and and um, well, it is for security. It's also um, can also detect anomalies in user and network elements, and that's good, and that's going to be very important. So basically, if you're going to use machine learning, um, what do you do with the data? So with data selection and sampling, you're deciding. Okay, so you've got a data set. Like let's say you've got a pcap file. You've got something. Um, so what part of what information in this thing do you do you care about? Uh, what do you want to represent? And that's often considered, that's often called your feature set. And um, another the most machine learning algorithms, you're gonna need to encode the data in some kind of mathematical fashion, a mathematical fashion, like just dumping the raw data usually is not gonna work. And then, uh, then there's um, normalization, like your um, so normalization. Essentially, you're transforming values to a range um, in between zero and one. And those, and this is just some things you do to, to get your data ready for machine to plug into a machine learning algorithm. And then this would be an example of normalization, like you're looking at the number of requests per uh, per second and your CPU utilization um, percentage. And that and that could be that could tell you like if you're being hammered by a DDoS attack, um, is is a Bitcoin miner gracing your gracing you while you were served with his presence? Is something wrong going on? So for so in here the request per second uh, feature have a range ten times larger than those of the CPU percentage feature. And so if we didn't normalize the those values, the distance calculation would be really skewed. And so we just address it. We basically address this by normalizing both features to the uh, zero to one range, or zero to one range, which is a pretty simple math. So essentially, one big thing in machine learning is uh, pattern recognition. So you're trying to discover explicit or latent characteristics um, hidden in the data. Um, and uh, a, a thing about that is. That, uh, one thing about that is that you can use an algorithm to recognize other forms of the data uh, that ex of the same characteristics, like for example, um, uh, botnets or command and control channels. Uh, you very often see similar behavior. Um, you also see like similar patterns, say in malware.
So essentially, uh, clustering. Um, clustering, the whole idea behind clustering is that bad things happen together. So, so with so with clustering, you maybe you want to uh, find how do you group things into clusters? And you want to group things in a cluster so that they're more similar to other things in the uh, to, to things in the same cluster than they are to other things. And there are a couple, there are different techniques you could use. Um, K-means and DBSCAN are two big ones. Um, DBSCAN, the advantage of DBSCAN is that you don't have to start with a preset number of clusters. So let's talk about a clustering example. So this is good. I just put the, the URL, I'll post the slides. Uh, this is where there are, uh, they're clustered. They're clustering incidents to in, um, incidents together. They actually, I believe, incorporate this into Splunk, um, so that you could you could recognize similar in, instances and keep track of response. You could re track of responses. So you could respond in a similar manner. So a lot of your stock, you're going to have um, a lot of these disparate input inputs coming from different sources. Um, so the, so that you'll get all your sources. You'll collect. And then this will allow them to uh, this. This will basically group them into incidents. So an incident is basically a, cl a collection of events happening on the same machine at the same time. Well, not, they may have the same uh, root cause, and so so basically you can find these similar incidents, maybe not on the same machine, maybe across the network. That could save the SOC analysts a whole lot of time because the um, SOC analysts sometimes often get to spend their time doing a lot of very tedious stuff. So clustering uh, takeaways, you can, uh, you can apply it to a lot of different kinds of data. Um, you do need to, you do need some statistical uh, validation and um, it's very useful in when you have a whole lot of data and you, that you need to find a way to sift through more efficiently. So that is clustering. See, classification. So classification is a little bit differently because classification is you've got these predefined class, and you're trying to figure out what what the odds are that a sample will be part of these part of this class. Uh, and classified classification is an example of supervised learning, which means you have to start with a pre-labeled set uh, data set. And one that one point is that a sample can belong to multiple classes at the same time. Like for example, um, a mango could be part of fruit, yellow, tropical, whatever. And um, it's like so. So for example, so for an example of classification, one really big, very common classification problem related to security is uh, classifying email as uh, spam or uh, benign or possibly phishing. Sometimes phishing gets its own classification. So let's try, let's try just some examples that you might do classification and security. You might look for a botnet because there's just a whole lot of commonalities with that. Um, and then this is this is uh, what this is basically what a Microsoft study did. They they basically uh, so they took they took uh, they issued a bunch of set HTTP requests to these uh, servers, and they were looking for a, a very specific set of uh, bot software. It, it, to be honest, it wasn't catching any kind of bot, it was sketching a kind with a very uh, common bot related control panel that used WordPress. So they were querying it and then, then they were using, then they were creating a uh, decision, they were using a decision tree model. Um, like, like, so for example, like they were sending, sending requests to path that, paths that were kind of consistent with known um, sketchy sites. And then this, for example, might be what a decision tree could look like if you were trying to uh, categorize a an unknown a website as a a uh, botnet command and control site, or whether whether or um, not. Like you, you could say, do you have a whole lot of daily visitors? If you if yes, it's probably not. And you know, has it made your Alexa top site list? If yes, probably not. Um, well, but maybe it's it's not getting many uh, visitors and your uh, URLs auto generated. Uh, that's bad. Um, it's not on your list, and there's an existing threat intel report on it. Uh, that's not good either. That's probably a bot, or that's probably a botnet. Just classification takeaways. Um, so classification again is a super uh, 
supervised learning model. There's a four phases of it, training, validation, testing, and deployment. And so a lot of times with uh, classific classification, you, you have to break your data into uh, training and testing data. And one thing with, with uh, classifiers is that it's it's not necessarily an absolute oracle. It's it's not telling you that it definitely is or it's definitely not. It's telling you what how likely it is that something belongs to a particular category. Like so, for example, um, like in your email, um, you know how like that, uh, benign email sometimes get caught in your spam filter and spam sometimes get through. Uh, that's an example of it not being uh, not being perfect. So another example, like finding finding um, malicious PowerShell scripts. So one of the things that people with PowerShell, the uh, attackers using PowerShell like to do is um, obfuscate their scripts. Like for example, um, any idea what this means? Uh, yeah, me neither. So what they so what they did was they took a whole a whole lot of uh, PowerShell scripts and they use something called and, and this is uh, this is a very interesting example of uh, machine learning uses natural language processing. So there's all these techniques in, in NLP that could extract meaning out of uh, it could attempt to extract meaning um, out of words. And so they used one of a well-known one called a word to vec algorithm. And they were able to actually extract these tokens and represent them in a way that showed the context. And this is just a the graphic is just an example of some clusters they found doing this way. So they, they, uh, they so what they basically did was they they had a very large um, set of tra set of uh, training scripts that were already labeled um, clean or malicious, um, and their and basically the project worked very well. It, um, it did really well with uh, recognizing aliases, which are pretty commonly used and. Um, PowerShell, um, and uh, so and uh, it, it yeah yeah it was pretty successful. So another thing you're doing is anomaly detection. Um, so essentially, you've got to think about what what represents normal. So what it, what is normal? What describes your in your data set could be anything. It could be like your network. Your network logs, uh, your your logs, uh, your network flow, whatever. And then if something ha is happening that's outside normal, that's considered outliers. Um, and so a lot of times, um, unusual is not necessarily bad, but it often is. Uh, it's like so it, it often might suggest uh, fraud or something like that. So you have an intrusion detection system, or also like an IDS. Uh, what do you want? You want uh, low false positives and false negatives. Like a false positive will waste your SOC analyst time. Um, a false negative, you'll miss a threat. Um, you want a reasonable learning curve. Um, you want something that can kind of keep up because security changes constantly. And you, you probably will have only a limited amount of resources. And then um, explainable alerts. Like for example, um, if you get an alert, um, you don't, you don't want to like disable somebody's account without knowing why. And then this is, and then these are just some um, things you would look for in a host, host intrusion detection system. Your processes, um, do you have a sketchy new user account? Um, do you have an unusual kernel modules loaded? Are you um, looking up, uh, I don't know, are you, are you looking up sites that are known bad doing DS lookups on sites that are a problem, um, unusual network connection, or have there been unexplained changes made to your registry? So just look for that kind of thing. There's a fairly there's a pretty useful tool tool for host intrusion genetic detection called OS query. Um, so uh, I mean it can it can measure reliability and compliance, but it's often used for intrusion detection. Um, so, for example, um, yeah, for example, like you can schedule it. You can populate queries to be tables to be queried later. Um, one limitation is it is not built to operate in an untrusted environment, and it does not have any built-in orchestration. But it can work with Chef, Ansible, Puppet, whatever that. So, network intrusion detection. Um, okay, so you've got a compromised host. 
it's probably going to need to um, initiate com uh, communication somehow because a lot of times like a firewall is not going to let you go in and make a uh, and establish a connection with that host. Um, So, so examples, some examples that are like your botnets, uh, APT, your AdWare, your spyware. You've got a number of tools you can use. Uh, TCP dump basically will capture all your network traffic. Um, Snort is a rules-based engine. Um, Zeek, which is all formerly known as Grow, supports uh, deep, deep packet inspection. That's kind of, kind of got its own programming language. It's traditionally it's used, uh, it's used signatures, but that can be kind of a limitation. Um, for example, like when you're doing it a dealing with a zero day or something that had that uh, does not have a signature. And then this and then these would be some of the things you would look for in web application intrusion detection. Um, your uh, basically unusual IP addresses like uh, you've got you've got maybe like a website that's just local and you're get, suddenly getting like a lot of traffic from China and Russia or Iran. Why um, basically if you're getting really strange URL um, Entities they they may be try they may be trying to uh they may be trying to fuzz it uh, if they're using strange characters they may be looking for vulnerabilities uh, or uh, other things that suggest uh, SQL and SQL injection um, user agent patterns like it like for example if you're doing if you're doing automated access if you're using curl or something you don't set your user agent it'll show it won't show one. Um, and malware analysis, that's kind of group by, that's basically group by family. And you've got a couple of ways you can analyze it. Your static, it's traditionally been identified by signature matching, but that won't catch your zero days. Um, typically a static analysis is when you look at the, you look at the code, maybe you decompile it. Uh, your dynamic analysis is when you run it in a sandbox. And then these would just be some of the things you would see in Android malware. If you're, String strings, um, API calls, network. Um, like for example, you might see references to system binaries, server addresses, um, checks to see if you're running an emulated environment, like if you've got malware, maybe they want to know if you're running it in a sandbox. And again, like we talked about in a previous example, obfuscation. And I've got to show my uh, Gen Xiness. I don't know if anybody recognizes this guy, but this is Bob Seeger and the Silver Bullet Band. So Basically, it's no sort of a bullet. Uh, as you talked about before, you've explainability. Like, um, do you always do you know why it is or why it's giving an alert? Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, human knowledge to, to uh, represent. Uh, there's problems called overfitting, and underfitting. Um, underfitting is like when it doesn't fit your data very your data very well. Period. Um, overfitting is like, for example, when it matches your training data too well, but not your real world data. Um, Garbage in, garbage out, which means you start with bad, bad data, or um, or if your AI system is being attacked, which it can be, uh, like sometimes directing a bunch of crap at a machine learning system is a kind of a form of attack. So basically, your takeaway: you've got the potential to automate some tasks and increase efficiency. Um, so the ability to look for anomaly detection or stuff that's going on strange is very useful for zero days or APDs or stuff that does not have signatures established. Um, uh, risk of error, um, like, I mean, one example, I, one example I feel like we all saw was uh, Facebook tried to automate some of its content management and you saw it doing some, and I think a lot of us saw it doing some really strange things. So this, so there's always a risk of error and we'll, we will, I think we'll always need competent security professionals. This isn't going to replace us. And then these are just some examples of machine learning software you could use. And I'm going to give some credits to my sources and list some additional resources. And thank you so much for your time.